So I've started the live event. <coughs> Alessandro, we are live. People okay. at home on the couch are following. So I will just ah, yes, get yes, this on you. Maybe I'll just introduce the talk. So let's see what time is it exactly. It's one minute to. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you in particular to Professor Tarantino to be here today. I mean, it's Glasgow Dundee is not too far, but it's still quite of a trip. Anyways, uh, we're very glad to have you here. This is um, the 16th Geotechnic Lecture. I would say repeat, but I'm sure that you've added some new stuff. Um, to, to the talk, and it's organized by the ICE Scottish Ground Engineering Group. I believe this is the last lecture of our, let's say, year. And um, uh, Professor Tarantino is Professor of uh, Experimental Geomechanics at the University of Strathclyde. And yeah, welcome uh, people online. This was supposed to be just an in-person event, but after uh, you begging online, please, please, please. Marco Sarroyo, I hope now you are uh, connected because I'm doing this for you in particular. <laughs> uh, there is a lot of people in the room. We will not turn around the, the, the camera. Uh, Alessandro, thank you again. The lecture will be about one hour. We will have some Q&A and um, after the Q&A for the people in person, maybe more Q&A around the beer in the pub. Thank you. Uh, I don't, I can see people online if you can confirm that you can see the screen and you can hear my voice. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming here and those who are attending online. Uh, okay, I should be able to move it on, which is okay. Uh, there are a number of people who have contributed to to this talk in a way or another. They are listed here. I'm not mentioning one by one. Uh, there are two parts. Uh, the first part is a bit more general and about where we are going and what we should go. Uh, what you see here is the evolution of global temperature, what we got up to now and what is projected until the end of the century. Uh, you see that there are different curves, uh, red ones, blue ones, and those curves is a prediction about what is going to happen with the temperature depending on how well or how bad we are behaving. And this is the story of climate change mitigation. So we are all hoping or working in order to go towards the blue lines, taking the green road. And this, this is what would happen if you are uh, successful in reducing carbon emissions. However, even if you are behaving well, you can see that until the end of the century, the global temperature is going to still increase substantially. So the climate will get worse and is going to definitely affect our geotechnical infrastructure, which means that in addition to the problem of net zero, we are dealing with the problem of climate change adaptation of our geotechnical infrastructure. There are works about understanding and predicting what is the effect of climate change on the response of our geotechnical infrastructure. There are research works at the local scale, single slope. There are works at the regional scale. This is by national highways. You see that what they are predicting, uh, the number of annual failures without or with climate change. Uh, this is a prediction about what is going to happen until 2000. 70 uh, for the number of buildings that are going to be damaged because of foundation subsidence induced by drought and you see that they are moving from uh, 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 just London from 800 to more than 2 million buildings that are going to be damaged. Uh, there are predictions at the global scale here about landslides. So there is a sort of general consensus in a way or another that climate is going to make things worse. Now, when we're looking about the, the effect of climate, we have two issues. The first issue is where we are about assessing the hazard. 
at different scales. When we are dealing with assessing the climate uh, uh, change hazard, we have two things that we need to look at. First, uh, the soil that we are dealing with that is interacting with the climate, either water in because of rainfall or flood, or water out because of evaporation or transpiration. This is affecting the surface portion of the soil that is unsaturated. So talking about climatic hazard means that we need to be to deal with unsaturated soil mechanics and soil hydraulics. Where we are with the research in unsaturated soils? Oh, I would say that in research on the research side, we are probably well placed in terms of lab testing, constitutive modeling and uh, numerical modeling. Uh, there are works in the literature about modeling, uh, measuring, monitoring and modeling climate change interaction. Where we are, uh, this is an IC event, so I'm from time to time I'm moving towards the practice. Where we are with unsaturated soil in engineering practice. Uh, in practice, we are dealing with design at two levels. If you go for detailed design, or the day we go for detailed design, probably we can recycle the research tools that we have. Maybe not in a very straightforward way. Our element testing is taking months, which is not the real suitable time for a professional work. But let's say that at the, uh, uh, for the detailed design, we can recycle those tools. Where we are really struggling with in practice is the conceptual design, when we need to assess the order of magnitude of a rainfall or an evapotranspiration, and then we need something relatively simple that can be managed, not with months for lab testing, not with weeks for constitutive modeling. So one first question is, do we have tools that are allowing the practitioners to assess uh, the order of magnitude of the effect of rainfall or transpiration on the response of the geotechnical structure. So this is the first question that in a way or another I'm going to address later on. Then there is a second issue. The interface between the ground and the atmosphere where the climate ground interaction is occurring is not a line is a vegetated interface, which includes the vegetation above ground and includes, let's say, 51 meter of topsoil where you have roots, where you have bacteria, where you have earthworms, you have fungi. So it's a very, very complex world. And as geotechnical practitioners and researchers, we are not used to it. So if you have ever seen a soil profile, uh, a borehole log, you will always see the first 50 centimeter, something, we don't care. And then we go for all the rest. Now, that interface is exactly the interface that is controlling the climate interaction because the water in and the water out passes through that interface. So if you're not able to manage and understand that interface, we cannot predict any has climatic hazard on our geotechnical infrastructure. If you bring the vegetated interface into, uh, into play, now we have a challenge even at the research level. And there are many challenges, but I'm spotting two of them that are requiring uh, a paradigm shift in our way we think about experiments. So uh, in traditional geotechnics, we take a sample from the field, we put it in the lab, and then we are assuming that what we are taking to the lab is representative of what happens in the field. Now we have two issues. It is more difficult to get a tree in the lab. And second, that interface, that 50 centimeter of soil is much, much heterogeneous. So if you want to take to the lab a representative elementary volume, we are talking about meters. And now this is becoming more difficult for our lab testing. So we need to think the other way around. We need to move the lab to the field rather than taking the soil. Uh, so, which means that we need to build instrumentation that is allowing us to test and experiment directly in the field. 
Then there is on the other end of the story is the vegetation from the soil, the, the, the geotechnical perspective is a boundary condition, definitely is a boundary condition in terms of water out because of transpiration. And at the moment, we are not managing that modeling very well. And in particular, we don't have physically based models that are allowing us to assess the transpiration that is generated by the plant. That, of course, transpiration means removal of water, means a change in degree of saturation and suction with mechanical consequences. Uh, I mention all the time rainfall and evapotranspiration, but we can, the story applies also to flood water. So uh, if you have a problem that is very, uh, 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 that happens in UK, so the, uh, overflow induced breach of flood embankments. The process is exactly the same of the rainfall. The same way you have rainfall infiltrating in the soil, you have flood water infiltrating in the soil, and the same way infiltrating rainwater is causing instability, you can model the instability of an embankment by considering the same infiltration of flood water within the embankment. So what are the geotechnical opportunities, especially for vegetation based adaptation? So the, the two stories are combined. The story of partial saturation, the story of vegetation are combined. So let's consider what happens. It's a soil profile. Uh, it's one dimension here, but could be easily two dimensional or three dimensional. When you have uh, a dry period, and you have evaporation or evapotranspiration, the pore water pressure becomes more and more negative, the red profile that you see. When you have rainfall, the pore water pressure tends towards zero, and then you have the blue profile. Now, when you are increasing suction, you are increasing the effective stress, so you are increasing the shear strength. Whereas when you have a rainfall, you are decreasing the shear strength. So if you're looking at the problem of ultimate limit state, you would like to stay on the red story rather than the blue one. So potentially, if I want to rely on suction to stabilize the slope, and I would like very much to rely on suction because that's a natural resource that we have, I would like to maximize the water out and I would like to minimize the water in. So ideally, I'm searching for the vegetation to do the job in this way. We do not always have problem at the ultimate limit state. We also have problem with the serviceability limit state. And the typical case, especially in England, is that you have London clay and drying and wetting is causing uh, shrinking and swelling of the clay. Uh, now, when you have an, uh, 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 an ordinary climate with uh, 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 drying and wetting periods, you are moving along a normal consolidation line, except when you have a prolonged drought and then you're moving back to a normally consolidated line, accumulating excessive deformation, or you have a prolonged wetting period and then you're getting, you're moving on the other side and you're getting ex excessive swelling. So if you have this problem in mind, you would like always to stay here, which means that for that type of problem, you would like to minimize both. You would like to minimize water in because it's getting you this side, and you would like to minimize water out because it's getting you this side here. Why vegetation is interesting? Uh, first of all, the vegetation is controlling the climate interaction. Uh, the interest in the vegetation is that it's controlling water in and water out, but that's a system that is susceptible of being manipulated. For example, if you have uh, an ultimate limit state uh, problem in mind where you would like to maximize water out because you are increasing suction, you can manipulate the transpiration process, for example, microbial activity or uh, other abiotic means. And the vegetation, not directly, but via the vegetated interface, that vegetated in uh, uh, that top layer when you have where you have roots and you have bacteria, you have earthworms, generally has uh, a different hydraulic properties than the subsoil. 
and you can manipulate hydraulic conductivity or the hydrophobicity of the root zone in order to minimize water in. So that interface, including the topsoil and the vegetation, can be potentially manipulated. So that's the interest in looking towards vegetation when I'm searching for a way to adapt the effect, the, the, our, my geotechnical structure to the effect of climate. For example, uh, when you have a prolonged drought period, uh, at some point the soil becomes non becomes dry and becomes non transmissive. So you cannot extract water from the soil because at that scale, you are essentially detaching the root from the pocket of water, pockets of water that you have around. There are biotic ways to bridge the root. Uh, to the pocket of water around by, for example, promoting root hair, by uh, uh, promoting growth of mycorrhizal fungi that acts act as a, an extension of the root system. You can have the mucilage that is also bridging uh, 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 the root to the water around and then increase the transportation process. Uh, the microbial activity in general or the activity of the roots via a number of different mechanisms are generating aggregation in the soil. So the, 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 the soil that you buy to put in your pot at home does not look like a geotechnical soil and is generally aggregated by uh, a number of different mechanisms and the aggregation is transforming the soil into let's say a granular one. So is creating much larger pores in the soil that is generating in turn, for example, a higher saturated hydraulic conductivity. A soil that is aggregated, uh, that is becoming much more transmissive in the saturated range, means that may play the role of a lateral drainage and divert rainwater. So if you have a sloping topsoil and then you have rainwater entering that soil, that topsoil, this may divert water laterally and preventing downward infiltration. Uh, for a number of different mechanisms, you are also creating an hydrophobic surface. So the water is as uh, can penetrate the soil uh, in a much more difficult way. Uh, and again, we are diverting by, we may divert by runoff the uh, potentially infiltrating rainwater and preserving suction in the deeper layers. Uh, we are not making the hydrology people happy because if you are increasing the runoff, we are creating the flood, but at least we are saving our geotechnical uh, uh, structure. And those mechanisms are very often uh, generated in different ways by the microbial activity. So by manipulating the microbial activity, potentially we can create a surface that is more hydrophobic. So why we have an interest in the vegetation-based solutions? I'm uh, uh, pointing for arguments why we should get into that complex story, which is complex for us as geotechnical engineers because we don't speak plants at all and we don't speak uh, bacteria at all. Uh, when you're assessing hazard, and this is where we are probably in, in uh, 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 we are at the stage where we can decently predict the hazard associated with the climate. The, the flow chart goes this way. If, if the mitigation is, is the mitigation required? If no, the end of the story. If it is yes, then you are asking, is the hazard localized? If it is localized, you go for traditional remediation techniques. But what happens if the hazard is diffuse? Rest and be thankful, for example, if you're coming that, 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 talking about the Scottish case, is a case of diffuse hazards. So you have an area of, let's say, one kilometer, a square kilometer. From time to time, you have a failure that is happening here and there. And then you cannot put the pile every 20 centimeters over the entire slope. So you cannot go for traditional. Uh, remediation technique. If you have kilometers and kilometers of flood embankments, if you have kilometers and kilometers of uh, clay embankments for railway clay embankments, and this is the case in England, you cannot apply a, a, diffu a, a, a traditional geotechnical measure over kilometers and kilometers of embankments. So you are looking for a diffuse remedial measure and vegetation or the ancillary 
microbial uh, community associated with the plants is a diffuse. So you can hydrocyt, for example, or you can inoculate spores associated with fungi, or you can spread bacteria and they are growing in a natural way. So this is the case where, uh, and this is the case of rest and be thankful, for example, where you are not competing between the traditional solution and the vegetation based one. I'm mentioning that because no engineers will go for a vegetation based solution, which is highly unpredictable. You don't understand it if you have an alternative, but there are cases where either you buy it or you have nothing else. So at this point, uh, uh, even if you don't like it, you are not very convinced about it, but that's the way to explore. There is a second interest in the vegetation. Now, everybody is talking about net zero, net zero, net zero, but in England, uh, is now the, uh, 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 the biodiversity net gain is becoming a mandate. So for any major infrastructure project, you need not only to make sure that you are not destroying the biodiversity, but you need to return 10% more. The story is that we, as civil engineers, we made so much damage in the past that now we have returned for what we did in the past. And in Scotland it is coming, so they are just uh, slowing down because they need to, they are working out the biodiversity indexes because the environment is different, but it's coming in Scotland as well. Now, two thirds of the world biodiversity lives in the soil. Ha! Huh. <laughs> so at this point, the engineer, the geotechnical engineer at this point may fix the store, the, may fix two problems with the same tool. So by promoting vegetation and bacteria, you can, if you've done it right, you can fix the geotechnical story, but you can also promote biodiversity. The uh, vegetation is carbon neutral or negative, because clearly you are capturing CO2 by photosynthesis. The story is not that straightforward, because the carbon that goes into the soil is then chewed by the micro, uh, 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 the microbial community and return back by, by respiration. So you need to find a way to fix the CO2 in the soil and not to be uh, 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 reput, uh, put again in circle by the bacteria, but potentially it is carbon negative. Uh, it's climate smart because plants are changing their anatomy depending on the climate that you have around. And last, See, this is the uh, 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 a report that was commissioned by Network Rail after the uh, accident that we got here in Scotland where there was a landslide and there, were, there was a train derailed with um, casualties. They turned towards uh, a task group and say, tell us what we can do to uh, improve uh, the management of our earthworks. Those are take those comments here that you see in black are taken straight from the executive summary of that report. Let's go for it. So focus on mitigating the effects of failures, because we is not practicable to detect nor prevent all earthwork failures. So this message is, okay, we can work on the hazard. And and try to predict where and when the failure is going to occur, but it's not going to happen. So instead of checking where the problem is, let's apply, let's give the medicine to everybody, even before knowing whether the problem may occur. And what is the medicine? They are defining that the medicine. They say vegetation is what you can give. So if you are working on the management of vegetation, that might be the way to protect all our earthworks all around. And they said vegetation should be treated as an asset. And the underlying message is that, oh, the biodiversity is a byproduct of our engineering remediation. When you go for vegetation, maybe not at the research level, but when you turn to practitioners, there are a number of issues that are raised. And they say, oh, we don't have physically based conceptual model for the vegetative infection. We don't know how to deal with it. That's true, but uh, that's our research contribution. So we should 
uh, generate conceptual models that are allowing the engineers to understand the problem, even if they are not understanding the details of the mathematics. Uh, we have no methods to engineer uh, the vegetative interface. The same way we have we have methods to engineer the ground. We put jet grouting, we put jet textile, we have uh, micro piles. We don't have ways to engineer that vegetative interface. That's true, but we have a lot to learn from the plant scientists because in plant science and in agriculture, they do it. And then the response is uh, difficult to predict and therefore it is impossible to design because the geotechnical engineer or all civil engineer, they would like that they're liking very much to go there to put their pile, leave it and forget about it forever. That's true because if you're putting a biological uh, bio-based measures, you need to check what is going on over time because the response of a complex ecosystem may change over time and you need to keep to monitor that. But my reply is that we have invented the observational method. So the idea that you are doing something and then you're updating the design based on the monitoring of your intervention, we have invented it to the point that this is sitting there in code. So we should not be scared about an approach where the design is not one go. So we do it, we install and we leave it, but we check what happens over time and then we are updating our design over time. Now I'm uh, I'm going to the uh, some of the contribution from uh, uh, by Stratlight and touching some of those points. Uh, and I'm touching those points here: transpiration, hydraulic behavior of the root zone, open air lab, which means moving the lab to the field, and the unsaturated soil mechanics in engineering practice. So I'm starting with the transpiration. When we look at the transpiration. Uh, first, we need to make it clear that the plant is not sucking up water. So when you have the bare soil on the left, you have an evaporation process because the vapor pressure close to the evaporating surface is lower than the vapor pressure in the atmosphere. When you have the transpiration, you have exactly the same story. The stomata are opening. You have a vapor pressure close to the evaporating surface, you have a vapor pressure in the atmosphere, and then because of that differential, you have an evaporation. So the transpiration is simply an evaporation that is occurring at the level of the leaf, and the plant is sucking up water from the soil to replace what is lost by evaporation. This is called the dilemma of the plant. So the plant would like to keep the stomata open to let the CO2 in and get the photosynthesis and get the food. But unfortunately, by keeping the stomata open, you are losing water. And that's the water that is sucked up by the roots to replace what is lost by the. When we talk about the transpiration process, we have two competing, if we have two fluxes. We have the flux that is demanded by the atmosphere, and we have the flux of water that is transferred by the soil system. And the flux that the soil system can transfer is limited. And there is a very simple reason to explain why the flux that the soil can transfer to the atmosphere is limited. Imagine that you have a one dimensional flow. Problem, you have the groundwater at the bottom of the uh, of the domain and imagine that you are solving the water flow problem by imposing a water pressure at the top. So if you're imposing a water pressure at the top, that's your boundary condition. You are getting as a response of the system a flux. If I'm imposing uh, uh, a water pressure that is hydrostatic and I'm inquiring the system, what is the flux that you're transferring? Of course, the flux is zero. But if I'm solving the problem by imposing a more negative pressure, then I'm generating that water profile, uh, water pressure profile, and then there is some flux that the soil is transferring to the atmosphere. If I'm keeping decreasing the pore water pressure, even up to infinite, what I will find that there is a, me a maximum flux that the soil can transfer. And that maximum flux can be understood by the fact that when moving the pore water pressure to minus infinite, the gradient goes to infinite. But the soil becomes dry and the hydraulic conductivity goes to zero and the product is a finite number. So uh, we have two 
different regimes in the in the in the transpiration or the evaporation process. Imagine that this is the limiting flux that the soil can transfer, and this is the potential transpiration, what the atmosphere is demanding. Oh, this can be accommodated because the atmosphere is asking something that is lower than the maximum that what the soil can transfer. This is called potential transpiration and or energy limited regime because now what is controlling the flux is actually the demand of the atmosphere. But let's imagine that you are sitting here. The atmosphere is asking for something and the soil say, no, darling, I cannot give you more than that. I'm giving you what I can. So at this point it's the soil that is controlling the actual transpiration. That's why it is called water limited regime, limited by the soil transmissivity. So when we talk about transpiration and the beneficial effect of transpiration, and we talk about how the, we can manipulate the plant in order to generate more transpiration and more negative pore water pressure, we need to separate the two. So I'm starting first with the case of the energy limited regime. So when the transpiration is occurring in this range. So we are the case where the, what the atmosphere is demanding is less than what the soil can accommodate, and then the transpiration occurs at the potential transpiration rate. First, is the transpiration making a difference? So now let's consider that very simple. It's a very, very simple exercise. You have a slope made of silt, you have a water retention curve, you have an hydraulic conductivity, and then I'm applying that boundary condition. I'm applying a period of antecedent rainfall of six millimeters per day and then high, high intensity rainfall. And then I'm applying at the same time in the previous period an evapotranspiration that is changing. Could be one millimeter per day, very low or very high, six millimeters per day. And for those different values of antecedent evapotranspiration, I'm calculating the factor of safety. Now, if you are increasing the antecedent evapotranspiration, the factor of safety of the slope at the end of the high intensity fall is increasing, and that's obvious. So if you are previously drying the soil very much, you are increasing suction, you are lowering down the hydraulic conductivity, you are preventing the, the rainfall, uh, rainwater infiltration. So the fact that the larger is the evapotranspiration in the, in the previous period, the higher is the factor of safety, that's obvious. But the number is interesting. So by changing the evapotranspiration, in this example, um, that, that you cannot generalize, but by changing the evapotranspiration by one millimeter per day, we are increasing the factor of state of 0 0.1, which is a substantial number. So let's go on with this idea in mind. One millimeter per day is 0 0.1 in increasing factor of state, just to have a reference. So if you are able to increase evapotranspiration by one millimeter per day, we are doing a already a very good job. And this is the target that I'm looking at. So uh, uh, before deciding how to manipulate the transpiration process or the evaporation process in the energy limit regime, I need to have an equation that is more than that. We have it. It's the permanent equation. We like it very much because it's physically based. And it's so physically based that it's essentially coming from a mass balance, water in and water out, and an energy balance, energy uh, in and energy out here. It is designed on the number of assumptions, for example, uniform parallel turbulent flow, but in principle, if you're managing some basic fluid dynamics, you can get it. And this is the equation that we get. Now, I'm not looking at the development of that equation, but that's, there are three, that, that equation is, has a very, very clear uh, uh, physical components. In order to have an evaporation or a transpiration process, for me, evaporation and transpiration is exactly the same thing, except that evaporation is occurring at the bare soil surface and the trans transpiration is the evaporation that is occurring at the leaf surface, but the process is exactly the same. So you need energy. So you need to supply energy for the latent heat of evaporation. So in order to transform liquid water in vapor you need to supply energy. So it's not surprising that you have the solar radiation here. That's the source of energy. And that's the reason why it is called energy limited. Then you need the gradient in vapor pressure, the same way we need the gradient in hydraulic head when you look at the water flow in soils. So you have the vapor pressure in the leaf, that is saturated one, this term here. You have the vapor pressure in the far field, but then you have the near surface vapor pressure that is controlled by the wind. So that's aerodynamic resistance. I'm not entering the detail, but it's something that is controlling the real vapor pressure that is controlling the flow. So the real flow is occurring because of the pressure differential between the vapor pressure in the stomata and the vapor pressure near the surface. And this is in turn controlled by the wind speed. 
And then, of course, what is coming into place is the stomata resistance because you have a bottleneck here in the vapor flow. And then the, uh, the lift area in, so the, the, uh, the, the area where evaporation is occurring, of course, is playing a role because if you have a small area where evaporation is occurring, a large area, you have more or less evaporation. Now, all this is the fundamental equation that is describing evaporation. Now, the point is that as engineers, can we manipulate it? Uh, we cannot switch off the sun. We cannot change the relative humidity, not in open air. But we can change that vapor pressure here. We can change the vapor pressure near the surface. And just to give you an idea that where the potential is, this is the evapotranspiration against the wind speed. The wind speed is controlling the vapor pressure close to the evaporating surface. And I'm considering three cases, bare surface, pasture and forest. I'm considering the same climate, all the rest is the same. I'm taking London in July and September and see how much the wind speed first is changing the evapotranspiration. So by moving from 0 0.5 to 2 meters per second, the evapotranspiration is changing from 6 millimeters to 8 point something. Remember, 1 millimeter per day is 0 0.1 de facto of safety. So by changing the wind speed, I can change it. But look at the difference. Why there is a difference between the pine forest and the bare soil? The difference is huge because you have 6.5 and then you have 8.5 here. There is a reason. And the reason is the air turbulence. So what is controlling the vapor pressure close to the surface is the turbulence near the evaporating surface. If you have a bare soil, there is no turbulence because the surface is flat. So a very little mixing and the vapor pressure is very close to the saturated one. But if you have very high turbulence and this happens in a forest because the canopy is not uniform, it's very rough and very undulated, you have a lot of mixing and then you are lowering down the vapor pressure close to the surface. So by looking, by observing what happens in the real world, I'm discovering that by changing the, surf, the air turbulence and by changing the air turbulence, by making the surface more or less rough, I can increase substantially the transpiration. And by increasing substantially the transpiration or decreasing substantially the transpiration, I can potentially affect quantitatively the factor of safety. So that's a way a possible approach to go for. So by changing the roughness of my canopy, should it be grass, should it be shrubs, should it be trees? We can also change the albedo. So what the real energy that is contributing to the process is the net energy between the incident one that is coming from the sun minus the one that is reflected. We are not used to it, but for example, in agriculture, they put the sunscreen on leaves. They put kaolinite that is white, that is reflecting. And in their case, is there is much more reflection, means less energy going to the leaf, and they are lowering down the transpiration process. Whether we can apply to soil set or no, but there is a way to manipulate that process. Uh, or we can use fungi. So fungi are uh, if you are inoculating your plant with fungi, the fungi are linking to the root system and are accessing water that roots may not access. And the fungi may contribute to get more nutrients to the plant that the root system is not capable of accessing to, but the fungi by exploring fine pores, they can get access to water and nutrients that the root cannot. So you can potentially increase the biomass and increasing the biomass incre means increasing the leaf area index, or if you wish, the, 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 the evaporating surface. So this is a test where we have been testing in the lab uh, non-inoculated grass and inoculated grass. Now, that's something that is happening in the lab with the sterile system, with a single uh, plant species, with a single fungal species, but see what happens with the evapotranspiration, potential transpiration here for the non-inoculated plant, 10 millimeters, and what happens here for the inoculated plant. And what happens, what's happening here is that the inoculated plant with fungi, you get more nutrients, the plant has more food, and is growing bigger. And growing bigger means that you have more evaporating surface and more transpiration. Uh, 
Uh, what happens in the water limited regime? This is the case where uh, you have uh, the atmosphere that is demanding for something. The soil says, oh, I cannot do it. I'll give you what I can give. Now we are a bit behind in the sense that for the potential transpiration, because we have a physically based model or equation for it, I could have understood where to play with in order to do the job. When we go to the water limited regime, we don't have a physically based equation. So before deciding how to manipulate the soil, the, the vegetated interface, I need to have a physically based equation that allows me to understand where to go. What we do in geotechnics, when we are just trying to fix some modeling issues, we are saying that uh, we are getting the transpiration as a product of two terms, the potential transpiration, and this is the transpiration that you would have if the soil can accommodate the evaporative demand of the atmosphere. And then we are multiplying by a coefficient that is saying, oh, at some point I cannot get, the soil is transferring what the soil can get. And this is a reduction function that is somehow simulating the water limited regime. And we set it in a purely empirical way. If you just would like to model something research, that's fine. But being empirical, we are not understanding it, understanding it. And the worst is that we don't understand how to manipulate, where to manipulate if you don't have a physically based equation. So we have been working on it. I'm going straight uh, quick. I don't have much time. So uh, in the real world, the flow is occurring through what they name the soil plant atmosphere continuum. So the water is flowing from the soil through the roots up to the leaves and then in the atmosphere. If there is a water flow, there should be a water pressure gradient. Strictly speaking, an hydraulic head gradient, but typically the elevation is small compared to the values of pore water pressure. So I'm here, I'm mentioning the water pressure gradient. So the water, the, uh, this is the suction actually, so the suction should be higher at the leaf and smaller in the soil. Imagine that you have, uh, you are not irrigating the soil, so if you are keeping on with evaporation, the soil is drying out, the suction is increasing, and then you are dragging the suction uh, at the leaf. The plant is sensing the suction of the leaf and says, oh, when the suction is at the leaf is reaching a certain value, I'm starting closing the stomata. I don't want the suction to increase beyond a certain value because then I'm desaturating, I'm getting embolism, I'm never going to recover it. So the way the plant goes and the way we are modeling it is the following. So you have the transpiration at the top and then you have the suction of the leaf at the bottom. When you are in the energy limited, the transpiration is constant, is controlled by the atmosphere. The suction of the leaf is increasing and increasing. But as soon as the suction is, is reaching a threshold, then the suction is maintained constant and physically the stomata are starting closing in order to maintain that suction constant. But as a consequence, your uh, water pressure, your, your transpiration goes down. So we are modeling the process by imposing that there is, first we are looking at the, at the system as a continuum, we are modeling the soil and the flow towards the root and the flow in the xylem. And then we are just assuming that this branch here, that is what we model using a physically based model, we are, set, we are saying if there is a limit suction, then I'm getting this function here as, as a consequence. I'm not getting all the details, but for example, uh, this is the equation that we get. And this lambda here is controlling the hydraulic conductivity of the soil. So this equation is saying that this decay the rate of the decay is controlled by the hydraulic conductivity of the soil. See this one here. So oh, this is the case of the same soil, the same atmospheric condition, but two different root systems. And you see that clearly because the two root systems are different, you are getting, you are starting from the transition from the energy and the water limited at two different values of suction, but the decay, because the soil is the same, is exactly the same. So, probably we are getting something right. 
Also, when you are developing the model, you are identifying all the components that you are expecting to control the transpiration. Because it's a soil plant atmosphere continue, you should have something that is associated with the soil, something that is associated with the root architecture, something that is associated with the root and leaf anatomy. So you, are, you should have parameters that are following the continuum. Now, I'm not entering the details here, but this is the case where, for example, we are using that model. We are uh, modeling. And uh, so what you have here is the relationship between the root length density and the threshold suction that is marking the transition. Uh, you have the experimental data, you have the model. The model has been only calibrated here. All those ones are genuine predictions. So now that you have a physically based model for the transpiration, we can probably look at where we should play with in order to manipulate the transpiration in the water limited. And I'm stopping here for the transpiration process. Uh, now, transpiration is one effect, which is called hydrological. So if you open and go to Wikipedia and say the roots have a mechanical effect, and we are the expert here, they have an hydrological effect. That is the transpiration. There is a third effect that no one is looking at, which I call it hydraulic, because the vegetated interface is changing the hydraulic conductivity of the surface. So those are data from uh, infrastructure slopes. I think that those are railway embankments. Anyway, those are measured values of hydraulic conductivity in London clay. And you see how much in the top 50 centimeters, how much the hydraulic conductivity is increasing. The same soil, so the same clay, the same compacted clay in place. So because here where you have roots, bacteria, you have a number of mechanisms that are increasing the porosity, either because you are increasing the porosity or because you are generating aggregation. Uh, same exercise, see what happens here. So I'm considering the case of uh, the original geotechnical silt, and then now I'm simulating the top layer, uh, I'm simulating the hydraulic behavior of an aggregated soil. Technically speaking, now I'm getting a bit more uh, unsaturated language, I'm dropping the air entry value and I'm increasing the saturated hydraulic conductivity. Because the water, the rainwater is diverted laterally by that highly conductive top layer, I'm preserving the suction here and the factor of safety is increasing. So that's another way of uh, using the vegetative interface to improve stability. It's not an ideal case here. So that's rest and be thankful. When you look at rest and be thankful, that's look a very nice infinite slope. You see that is pretty flat. So we went there because that's an infinite slope, very simple. If you have an infinite slope from an hydraulic point of view, you have a swimming pool because there is impermeable bedrock. There is no lateral flow because the slope is infinite. What is going one side is the other side. So which means that what happens in the slope is associated with water in because of rainfall and water out because of evapotranspiration. Now, if you go there, you have third. 3,000 millimeters of rain for in a year, and then the transpiration is something like 400. So you are immediately saturating the slope after a few months. So if this was the mechanism, the less than bitangle should have disappeared years ago, or decades, or hundreds of years ago. But the slope is still there. Now, uh, let's look at the grain side distribution. So you have the topsoil, you have a transition soil, and then you have the subsoil. When you do the grain side distribution, it is exactly the same. But if you're looking at the top soil, it looks very compressible. You see visually very high pores because the microbial activities and the roots are creating aggregation, which means that the hydraulic conductivity of the soil measured is much higher than the hydraulic conductivity of the subsoil. The grain side distribution is the same, but the aggregation is entirely different. Let's say the fabric is entirely different. And then we have speculated an entirely different mechanism. When you have the rainfall, because this soil is very conductive, then the water is drained laterally towards the streams because the slope are, is made of many gullies. And then we remodel the slope by considering a slope stability looking at the infinite slope. But when time went to look at the hydraulic problem, we modeled the problem by considering a two-dimensional flow, but in a transverse direction. We, we simulate in a very fair way, so we, that we made a number of assumptions, but in a very fair way. And you say, is this model credible if you are simulating the time and 
the time of failure of two very specific event and we did probably this mechanism is reasonable so what we have speculated in the end and this is just to in, uh, highlight the role of that vegetated interface is that when you have an ordinary rainfall all the water goes laterally because it's diverted laterally Ex when you have an exceptional rainfall and the rainfall is exceeding the drainage capacity of that natural lateral drainage water is starting infiltrating down and causing the slope failure which also means that if I need to look for vegetation, this is our speculation, I would not like to go with deep vegetation because if I have deep root system, I'm facilitating the transfer of water. If what you're speculating is right, we should have a shallow vegetation that is spreading the roots laterally and increasing the draining capacity, drainage capacity of that top layer. Uh, uh, that layer has fungi. Fungi tends to generate an hydrophobic surface. Those are not mycorrhizal fungi. Those are saprophytic fungi, but they share a number of things together. So this is an experiment as struck like by Gronje and, uh, and Emmy. So you see what is the difference when you have a clean sand and is hydrophilic, and when you have uh, a clear um, and hydrophobic sand generated by the fungi and then so the fungi generating hydrophobic surface again if you want to appreciate and you can see it in the water retention curve so uh, when you have a clean sand you have and you are wet in the soil you are getting this way when you have uh, a fungal treated soil you are lowering the air the water occlusion suction if you want to have an appreciation how much this may affect, this is the case of the same slope. I'm changing the surface now and I'm creating the top layer hydrophobic. So I'm lowering the entry value or the air occlusion value. And you see that potentially we can affect the slope stability because you are diverting a lot of water. That you are diverting a lot of water and then you are improving the stability. That's obvious. Now I'm trying to quantify numbers and try to understand if this effect could be potentially quantitatively relevant. Okay, 10 minutes, I should get it. Uh, a few snapshots about the open air lab. Uh, as soon as we say that what happens is, is happening in terms of transpiration in the soil plant atmosphere continuum, the same way we monitor water content, water pressure in the soil, we need to do the same in the plant because it's part of the same continuum hydraulic process. We know what happens in the soil. What we don't know is what happens here. So we don't know how to measure that. Uh, xylem water potential is something that plant scientists have been measuring uh, for decades, uh, using techniques that we have borrowed uh, from them later on, sometimes with, by knowing it, sometimes without knowing it. So they use the uh, high capacity tensiometer. They use now um, I'm getting it. I'm going to some unsaturated specific technical language. So you may miss something here. So the same way we are testing unsaturated soils with the axis translation, they have invented it to measure the suction in the leaf. And they are using the equivalent axis translation that we're using this. Actually, it's the other way around. We borrow from them our technique. They're using the psychrometer because what they do to measure the suction in the plant is what we do in soil. They said, oh, why we are not using the high capacity tension that you have developed for the soil for the plant? And this is what we did. We stuck high capacity tensiometer that you will find in the geotechnical literature on the exam. We expose the exam, we put the tensiometer into it. So this was our very first experiment. Now, just by curiosity. Uh, this is the first, so this is the, the uh, uh, water pressure in the xylem. Forget about this initial part because it's the equilibration time. What you see here is that you have a peak around five o'clock and then you have sunset. When you have sunset, the stomata are closing because there is no need for the stomata to remain open because there is no sun anymore. So the stomata are clever enough to close them. There is no transpiration, the poor water pressure goes up. This is what happens at night, nothing. You have the sunrise and then the poor water pressure is starting going down because the stomata are open, you have a flux. That's a cloud. 
when you have a cloud passing over the, the plant, the plant says, OK, there is a cloud, there is a less energy. Let me close the stomach a little bit because there is no need for much sun and the pressure goes up. So we have now a tool uh, to monitor the suction in the, uh, uh, in the plant. Uh, this is to highlight what is something obvious for us. It's not something obvious to plant scientists. And there's a clash when you're trying to talk with another community. So the flux here goes upward. So you have one tensiometer here, you have one tensiometer here, and then you're measuring suction in the leaf. During the day when you have transpiration, you have the bottom tensiometer here, you have the intermediate tensiometer here, and then you have suction in the leaf. There is a gradient. Of course there is a gradient, because if you don't have a flux, you need to have a gradient in pressure. And this is nice to see that those two tensiometers overnight are equal because there is no flux, and they are departing during the day. Try to convince the plant scientist that this is right, because they look at the pressure chamber here, the suction the lift, and say, oh, this is different from the plant. Your tensiometer is wrong. This is the simultaneous monitoring of the suction in the soil and the suction in the leaf. You see that the suction in the leaf or in the plant goes up and down because you have the day and night cycles. The stomata are opening during the day and closing during the night. What you see here is the difference between the suction in the soil and the suction in the plant. And here you have the measured transpiration. So you see that when the transpiration is constant, you are in the energy limited. The difference is very small. It remains constant, sorry, not small. When the transpiration goes down because this, the plant is struggling to suck up water. Then you have the plant is trying to cope with it by increasing the suction in the leaf and then opening up the differential between the two. You can also see that at the very end, the, the, the fluctuations are disappearing because the stomata are closing. So at this point, you don't have any difference between day and night. So the interest here is that in the lab, it's easy to measure the transpiration and the water limit because you put a pot on the balance. But when you go to the field, measuring the transpiration is much more difficult because you cannot put a balance under the tree. So here, potentially, if you want to measure and characterize your hydraulic system that now includes the plant, you have the tensiometry. Um, two minutes for that. Uh, measurement, the monitoring the field that serves two purposes is the hydraulic characterization before designing your intervention because you are moving the lab to the field. And then the monitoring system serves after the intervention because uh, it is supporting your observational method approach. We have everything we need. But if you want to have a portable system, for example, uh, install excavating a trench, as you see here, and that's what everybody does. It's taking three, it was taking three hours and a strong guy to do the job. This instrument is, so this trench was to install sensor to measure the water content, the water potential, the suction in the soil. This instrument, you are drilling it and then you're pushing down a sensor. The uh, working principle is exactly the same as the local sensors installed in the trench, but this is making a difference if you want to have a portable system. So spending 20 minutes, and now it was a sunny day, but if it is a rainy day, spending three hours excavating a trench under the rain or spending 20 minutes, it makes a difference. So when we move to the portable system, we have theoretical aspects or conceptual aspects, but we also have practical ones that we need to look at. This is the tensiometer installed in the plant. This is the crocodile. So this is measuring gas exchanges at the leaf. So we need to have a monitoring system that is taking all the process through the soil, the plant and at the leaf. So this is, for example, a transpiration that, of course, is very measured at the leaf, very small during overnight. And then the vineyard has one side exposed to the sun and one side not exposed to the sun. And you see that was clearly visible a difference in transpiration between the exposed and the not exposed. I'm skipping all of that because there is nothing uh, special except that at the moment we only have uh, one sensor to measure the suction in the soil that we can leave unattended. 
that is the porous block sensor produced by uh, meter group. Fine, nice. Uh, although we have nothing conceptual to work with, but we have some practical problems that the calibration curve that is provided by the manufacturer has nothing to do with the calibration curve that we are developing uh, experimentally in our lab. So again, there are not major research challenges, but a number of practical ones that we need to look at. This, I'm skipping this, I'm skipping this, and I'm going to the end. Uh, in one minute, what we should do to enable the engineer <coughs> to work with conceptual design. Uh, we cannot go there and deploy a number of experimental, conceptual, numerical and theoretical concepts that are difficult to digest in the little time they have. We need to be able to serve unsaturated soil mechanics to uh, use concepts and ideas and tools that we have developed in the saturated soil mechanics, and those are the tools that a normal engineer has developed. So I'm skipping all of that. But this paper here is doing the job. So we are saying, is there a way to understand and to predict in a conservative way the effect of rainwater infiltration on pore water pressure? Oh, yes, we can, because by making a number of simplifying conservative assumptions, we can do it by developing a tool that is very familiar to a saturated person, because these are exactly the isochrons that you have developed in the um, Terzaghi's consolidation equation. And is there a way to estimate the soil shear strength in a simple way? Yes, there is, because by uh, we can easily for the granular materials replace for a problem of slope stability only the effective stress of saturated soil with the effective stress of unsaturated soil by just placing a degree of saturation in front of the pore water pressure if you have a granular material. And then if you have an uns a clay material, we can easily uh, estimate the contribution of the shear strength, the contribution of suction to shear strength by considering the contribution of suction just at the transition when the soil becomes unsaturated. So if you have a clay and then you are increasing suction or you are making the pore water pressure more and more negative, there is a range where the clay still remains saturated. If you are taking a picture of the shear strength here, and this is something that we are dealing with saturated material, you have a contribution to strength in a clay matter that is more than enough to stabilize whatever you wish. So there are ways, I'm not entering the detail, but that was the last uh, part of the presentation. So trying to bridge the gap between research and practice. And I'm stopping here. I, there are conclusions, but that's fine. Thank you, Alessandro. Are there questions, comments? Yeah, Jonathan? So, if I understood correctly, you were looking at all the different characteristics of vegetated soil to kind of act as a, a natural barrier or an inverted barrier system, I think you said at one point. Um, you know, it, it can control horizontal runoff and prevent water getting into slopes. Is there a role, do you think, for perhaps using vegetation within the design of conventional barrier systems? I mean, is there a way we can use vegetation to perhaps manipulate uh, the way they work? They do it with uh, evapotranspirative capillary barriers. So the people in Hong Kong, they've done this way. So they have a cover and they are counting on the balance between rain in and then they're using the plants to remove the rain for the rainwater that is accumulating in that barrier. 
Of course, you need to make sure that the hydraulic characteristics of the barrier and the characteristic of the plants uh, and the local climate conditions are enough for the. So this is what they do for the. Uh, potentially, this is what you can do in your infrastructure as well. Uh, so there are two different stories here. Clear is one thing is when you have a new structure. And then you are, uh, this is what happens when you have uh, a, 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 a landfill, for example. So you are creating something new. So you are deciding the soil, you are deciding the plant. You just need to make sure that after a certain time, there is no uh, 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 other species that invading species that are overturning your system. Uh, this is this is done already for the barrier, so I can I can see it easy for a new embankment, for example, or a new cut slope when you're exposing the bare soil and then you are revegetating it. It is more challenging when you have an existing system. So when you have existing flood embankments in England, uh, when you have railway embankments in England, those are there. So at some point you cannot uh, 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 There is a natural system there, already there, controlling the interaction. You cannot overturn it because that's a complex ecosystem. So the only chance for it is probably to apply a perturbation to the system and hoping that you are not making much damage. And then you are uh, applying a perturbation in, in, in the right way. So for existing system, the story, of course, is different. And this is what we are looking at because in the developed countries is probably more existing infrastructure rather than ones. Or, yeah, um, I have two quick questions. Um, the first of all, thanks for the presentation. It's an excellent presentation. Um, the first the question about um, the suction and the development of suction, and as far as I know, suction is like depends on the. Of course, the, you have the capillary rise in the material. This is what I think you are relying on. Um, did you like distinguish between the types of soils? How much suction would you go, would you get in, for example, clay, when compared to sand, for example, in the same circumstances? Have you done any distinction between the soil types? It is is not a straight answer. Uh, what we are really looking at, especially when you're looking at slope stability problem, we would like we are doing two things at the same time. We would like to increase suction because when you are increasing suction, uh, you are increasing the effective stress. But at the same time, you would like to you wish to increase suction to decrease the hydraulic conductivity. So when you are increasing suction, you are decreasing the hydraulic conductivity, and this is what we're really looking at. So uh, um, we would like to increase suction enough during the dry period in order to lower the hydraulic conductivity and prevent rainwater infiltration during the wet period. Now. Uh, uh, we are mixing three things at the same time and there is not a straight answer. It is true that you can develop suction in sand that are much lower than suction in clay, but it's also true that the friction angle is higher. So then the story of the hydraulic conductivity is a tricky one. The story of that I'm trying to get the curve that is making things simpler here. Uh, I know it's probably here. So this one here. So this is a silt and the silt aggregated, but it would be the same that you have a clay and you have a sand. So the, the sand has a larger pores, which means that when you are desaturating much more quickly, you see. Which also means that your hydraulic conductivity goes down much more quickly. But under saturated conditions, the hydraulic conductivity is higher. So you see that in terms of hydraulic conductivity, the sand is more is less conductive if you have if you are developing very high suction. So the sand is true that is developing lower suction, you see here. 
But it's also true that if you are in a certain range, it becomes more impermeable if you are in the unsaturated range. And that depends. So there are competing effects in terms of suction and hydraulic conductivity that you cannot have a straight answer. One of the slides I just did not understand, or maybe I didn't see it uh, very clearly. There were like two graphs comparing, I think, the wind speed and the evapotranspiration in London, one in September and one in July, or like yes. two months. There was a clear difference between the two months, which I didn't know why, because it's the same, I think. Um, um, All right, first of all. Let's take one type of vegetation. So, for example, take the pine forest here and the pine forest here. So, the vegetation is the same, the soil is the same. The only thing that is changing between July and September is the climate. So, the solar radiation is changing very high in July. No, there is a mistake here. It should be lower than 20 uh, megajoule here. The relative humidity is 50%, and here is another, it should be probably put 80%. And the temperature is 25 and temperature is 20. So in July, there is much more solar radiation. So much more energy that I'm supplying for the latent heat. So you have higher evaporation. So those numbers are wrong. As I'm now realizing that, but you can see it that for the same type of vegetation, the evapotranspiration is much higher in July and much lower in September. It's not just a function of the Now, for the same type of vegetation, for the same wind speed, you have the effect of the, uh, 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 um, of the weather meteorological variables. Then, for the same climate, then the wind speed is playing the role because you are increasing the evaporation, which is the same reason why when you are not overheating, when under the sun, when you have a wind speed, when you have wind, because the wind is facilitating the evaporation and is facilitating the subtraction of heat from your body. So this plot here is saying exactly what happens when you are sweating or not sweating when term. So the wind speed here, when you are increasing the wind speed, you are increasing, so you are doing this job here. So this is a saturated vapor pressure, 100%. This is the vapor pressure in the far field, 50%. This vapor pressure here, that is actually really the control in the evaporation, because the evaporation occurs between here and here, is somewhere in between this one and this one. If the wind speed is very high, you are essentially very effective in replacing this vapor with this one in the far field. So this number is becoming 50. If there is no evaporation, this vapor pressure becomes close to 100. So the wind speed is telling us that the real evaporation process is controlled by this gradient. This gradient is controlled by the vapor pressure here. This vapor pressure here is either going up or going down, depending on the wind speed. So this plot here is telling you that the wind speed is changing things because you are more effective in dropping the vapor pressure there. But it's not just the wind speed, it's the surface roughness as well. So what is causing this pressure, this vapor pressure here to go close is the wind speed, but also the surface roughness because you are increasing the turbulence. So this plot is saying two things at the same time. For the same roughness, the wind speed is doing the job. And for the same wind speed, the surface roughness is very little evaporation in the best. So it's flat and this is making the things much better if you have a rough surface. I have a question. Uh, when you showed the experimental results of the, uh, the plant in the pot, you showed the suction um, and you, had, you showed the model before that you cut the suction. And in the lab data, it seems that it went on even if they, you were saying they, they're closing. So do you think... No, you're right. So if you're talking about this one, this is in contradiction with our model. No, I mean, I don't know... What if you're talking works. about this one here, right? I mean, your model, you made the assumption we cut the, yeah, basically you said we will cut here. Yeah, in this lab. yeah, yeah, no, this but does not happen. We, we see no, in this be, case, does not happen. Can you comment? I mean, do you think the model will still be working on, uh, let's say, um, uh, I, I just noted that. So, 
True. Uh, no, I cannot comment on that in the sense that uh, uh, you are right. So what I would have expected here is that this section, I was saying that this section is remaining constant, uh, which is not happening here. Uh, no, I don't have an answer for that. Although... Are they getting drier and so smaller pores? Is it to drink more? But... <clears throat> This is just uh, something I noticed. No, no, you are absolutely right. So this one is not showing. So there might be, uh, this is suction in the xylem and not this is the suction in the leaf. Okay. Although probably if the suction in the leaf is remaining cause, that should be in the xylem as well. Uh, if the stomata are closing, does not necessarily mean that you're stopping transpiration because you might have either leakage through the stomach. So the stomata are closing but there might be stomatal leakage, or you might have what they call cuticular transpiration, that is, so the tissues that are forming the leaf and the stem, etc., are not perfectly impermeable, so you may still have evaporation that is occurring there. Now, don't ask me much. Uh, this is something that, for example, plant scientists are exploring in order to explain the dieback of the trees, because in principle, the trees should close the stomata and prevent the dieback. But they are dying, so this is so that could be uh, one. Uh, those could be explanations. Although the power of the model, and clearly this assumption here that the suction remains constant is a very simplifying assumption in the sense that there are data in the plant side that are showing that this happens. There are data that this is not happening. The power of the model is not that one, is that all the physical ingredients, root and density, solid only conductivity, those are explaining some of the experimental data that we have. So when we look at the uh, when we look at the experimental data, we see experimentally the effect of root and density. We see experimentally the effect of potential transpiration. So that function is changing depending on potential transpiration, depends on root and density, depends on solid hydraulic conductivity. And that model qualitatively captures that very well. So the power of that model, despite the simplifying assumptions, is that we are capturing the physics of the process. So we have a physically base. That is not going to be perfect, but at least tells, tells us where to intervene if you want to manipulate the process. But yes, this does not happen. And the other question I have is about, uh, you know, unsaturated soil mechanics. You always have this relationship between suction and then as you go dry, 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 it goes up. But um, many models do not account completely dry. So that suction goes to infinite, but at some point, uh, the completely dry state sometimes is not taken into account. Uh, true, although the hydraulic conductivity is, is going, yeah, so it's is in, get, getting a limit practically much earlier that you're going to this ideally purely dry condition. So, but like in reality, you have, you can have completely dry soil. Let's go to the desert uh, is an example. If you have, if you have a sand, yes. If you have a sand, you might have a completely dry soil and then the sheer strength of a completely dry soil becomes the same of a saturated. The proof that if you put a piece of sand in the oven, you get it granular, you get yeah. the cohesion less if you let me. If you put a piece of clay in the oven, you get a brick. So that's a very empirical way of saying that you're never getting completely dry in a clay. So the dry soil does not exist except for the pure sand, practically. Like the, the last uh, equations that you showed, the practical way to account for this um, for practitioners. Ah, uh, the in, that, in that case, the degree of saturation, they work when SR is zero. Okay, so uh, uh, when we look at the practitioner story, we can do something good and useful if you're looking at the shear strength. So we have tools to simplify unsaturated soil mechanics if you're looking at the soil shear strength. And if you're looking at the soil shear strength, which means stability problem, so ultimately mistake, you are just looking at the wet side, not at the dry side. So you're just concerned about what happens when you have a rainfall. So that's why in that case here, I was not concerned about the dry side. If you want to look at the dry side, and this happens, for example, when you have the, dry, the drought and then your clay shrinkage, and then at the moment, 
Now, there might be ways. We have not worked on that. There might be ways to simplify it uh, to get something useful for practitioners. Because mechanically, when the soil is getting desaturated, at the onset of desaturation, the clay is <coughs> top shrinking. So you don't need to go to the very ice action if you're looking at the mechanics. So the clay is an off response. So when you're drying the clay, take a saturated clay. You are drying the clay. So you are generating suction, you are generating effective stress. It moves along a normal consolidation line. As soon as the clay desaturates, the void ratio stops. So you are getting what we call the shrinkage limb. So mechanically speaking, all the deformation of the clay occurs in the saturated range. And mechanically, we are not concerned about the, but that will be a story which is not developed there. Thanks for your presentation, very informative. Matthew, should I read two hours at least? <laughs> yeah. uh, just out of curiosity, uh, so uh, the winds are seasonal, uh, the vegetation are also seasonal, so it doesn't mean that, let's say, for a slope, the factor safety of the slope is also seasonal, also changed. No, say again. Is the factor of safety season? Yeah. Uh, Changes with seasons. Yeah, like oh no, yes, of course it's changing with season. Of course we change with season. But the season that if you're looking at a slope stability problem, the season we are looking at is the wet season. So uh, the effect of vegetation is not to increase suction because it is increasing suction when we don't need it during the summer. Or let's say if you have that. Uh, the effect of transpiration is to drop the hydraulic conductivity in order to amper water infiltration when you have the wet period. That's the real hydrological reinforcement of the slope. And this was a quarrel with our plant science people. They said, oh, the suction is, you are, you are generating suction where you don't need it. And then during the wet period, of course, if you have a prolonged wet period, depending on the climate, the soil, et cetera, then possibly the memory of the low hydraulic conductivity that you have generated by the ice action repeatedly is lost during the wet period. So uh, the effect of transpiration may be effective uh, under certain conditions. But yes, so the, the hydrological reinforcement is not the suction, is the drop in hydraulic conductivity that is attempting to prevent the suction that you have generated during the dry period. I don't know if there is someone online. Can you see online? There are some questions? No, no questions. They were not saying that they could hear you. Um, well, before we close, I have just one very quick question. That is, what is worse than to, to live in a dry place where you have like thunderstorms or, um, I mean, what is worse than? <laughs> Like in this climate change that we see, you know, uh, in Milan, we usually don't have like the weather that we have in, in Africa, where we have. <laughs> uh, but with climate change, we see this changing a lot. So, um, so if you're talking about if you're talking slope? about rainfall, it is intuitive and is observed yes. experimentally. So, uh, if you have a dry period, you have a certain hydraulic conductivity at the surface. Uh, if you have a high intensity rainfall, let's say that the hydraulic conductivity is one millimeter per day, your rainfall is 10 millimeters per day, this water is not infiltrating. So most of the uh, water is running off and then is saturating only a very top layer. So you have a very shallow landslides or shallow failure. If you have the same amount of rainfall that instead of concentrating in one hour, with the very high intensity. The same volume of rainfall is spread over a very long period. So the rainfall intensity is becoming 0.1 millimeters per day over 30 days. All this water is infiltrating down, which means that a prolonged rainfall of low intensity tends to penetrate in the soil much more easily than the high intensity rainfall in the very short duration. 
And the proof is that when they are looking at uh, uh, slope stability at the regional scale, this is what happens empirically. So when they are producing the plot of landslides or rainfall events that are generating a landslide and they are producing the rainfall uh, intensity duration plot. So what they slope stability people at the regional scale, they put the duration on the horizontal axis, they put the intensity on the vertical axis, and they are looking at the uh, uh, hydrological trigger of landslides as observed experimentally at the regional scale. So they take uh, the uh, satellite photographs and they see when the, where, where the, the, when the landslide is occurring. And what they observe is that what is critical are either high intensity rainfall of short duration or low intensity rainfall of very long duration. Low intensity rainfall of very long duration are triggering a deep failure. Whereas the shallow, the high intensity is triggering a shallow one, let's say meters or centimeters. So the answer is depends on where you are expecting the failure surface to be triggered. Thank you. Which means that the high intensity is probably protected by the root mechanical reinforcement because you are getting the saturated layer, so the, the very top where the roots are still there. Mm -hmm where the low intensity rainfall because the water is going down where the roots are not there anymore at this point the mechanical reinforcement is not doing the job i was thinking i'm thinking out loud the following year so, so following on from that so the, you could still get the ground completely saturated if there is an event big enough but by being able to draw down the water table as much as you can you basically reduce the likelihood of an extreme event to, because there are there are many smaller events that won't now cause a problem because the water can get in and won't necessarily be enough to fully saturate the soil. It's a nice level as well. Good. On this note, then, thank you again, uh, Sam. Thank you very much. I can close everything here, right? Yes, yes, we can.